Okay. All right, so I start. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, today, for those of you who are not yet awake, it's all right. We have a we're talking about a dream here, the model. Um, but actually, uh, after my experience yesterday with the Speedy model, I decided to change the title of my talk. All right. So uh, this is the new title. Uh, although slow and steady wins the race is what they say. Um, no, I, I can crash my model as well, though. Uh, so this is a di an empirical dynamical approach to teleconnections. So little by little, I will explain what that means. But um, so let me just give you an outline of the talk to start with, though. Um, so this is the dream model. I've had this model for a long time, and I've only recently decided to give it a name. And it's called the Dynamical Research Empirical Atmospheric Model. So empirical is the key word here. It means that you, we're actually appealing to data to provide some of the forcing functions of this model. And this, most of the work that I'm going to show you is with my long-term friend and collaborator, Stephanie LaRue. And uh, recent stuff I've been doing in Brazil with uh, Tercio and Jose Leandro in, in Sao Paulo. Um, so imagine that I'm um, the director of a large climate research center, and I'm giving you an overview of our activities. Um, <clears throat> what normally happens is that the first slide looks like this, and it's a very nice it's nature. It's, it's beautiful. We have trees, we have clouds, we have volcanoes. And in there somewhere, look, there's that arrow there, wind, you see? That's atmospheric dynamics, OK? And, uh, and, and you think, well, this is very inspiring. And this is the first slide of these talks always looks like this. Second slide of the talk always looks like this. Right? And, and this is the point, right? So, so you have uh, all sorts of, where well, you have your core, your dynamical core, your atmosphere and your ocean. Um, oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and uh, then you have all sorts of other stuff going on. And um, this is, okay, necessary for a comprehensive simulation. And, and, and yet, it can interfere with understanding the, the contribution of the dynamics. So there's different approaches towards stripping this away and trying to concentrate on the dynamics. And, and the speedy model is, is a much leaner beast than this, but it still has a fully physically based approach. Whereas I, what I'm going to do is go one step further and just remove everything and replace it with data. That's, that's our approach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it goes with salt and so. <laughs> yeah. so let's, let's so this is the dynamical re research empirical atmospheric model. There's a link here, but essentially it's a link to a presentation which is very much like this one. So for you. Uh, not much point. So I'm going to talk about the way in which this works to start with. Um, then I'm going to go into some detail about uh, a new piece of work on the adding an annual cycle to this model. Um, then I'll talk about some perturbation runs we've done for remote influences on South American rainfall. Uh, a little short section on condensation heating, which I've put into the model, uh, and then if time allows, various other bits and pieces which illustrate the types of things you can do with this modeling system. So um, I'm going to flip through the first bit very quickly because uh, uh, it's not really for this um, presentation. But I mean, it's a model. It's a primitive equation model. Uh, you can imagine the momentum equations uh, like this in a very simple form. You can form a vorticity equation like this. Uh, the real momentum equations, the primitive equations, have more terms. They have these advection terms. They have Coriolis term. Uh, but you can actually still write them in this way. And that's what Hoskins and Simmons did. When And so this is from their 1975 paper. Um, and you can also write the divergence equation uh, using the similar terms. Okay, So the Hoskins and Simmons primitive equation model, and this is a scan from their paper, um, 
Psalms 4, the vorticity, the divergence, uh, temperature, surface pressure, and there's the hydrostatic equation. So five equations, and um, these are the variables which the model uh, solves for, vorticity, divergence, temperature, surface pressure, and um, these are some of the names which are given to some of the other terms in the code, all right? Uh, this is supposed to be for a very hands-on type uh, uh, training course. The uh, time scheme is a semi-implicit scheme, so you can uh, summarize the divergent part of the flow with these equations, and then you can eliminate for the divergence, and you get this elliptic operator, uh, this wave operator for um, the gravity wave uh, equation, which has a source here. So uh, we have like, fluxes, sources, and the gravity wave source, and it's that part which needs to be solved semi-implicitly. That means that the time step has a kind of average between the present step and the, and the future step to filter the gravity waves and allow a longer time step. But I'm going through this you know, very quickly because it's not our main interest today. It has spec it's a spectral model. Um, it is a triangular truncation. So this is wave zonal wave number, radial wave number. And it's a kind of funky, tr jagged triangular truncation. Uh, which means that uh, for each zonal wave number, you have the same number of even about the equator and odd about the equator spectral coefficients. Um, so traditionally, that was useful for doing hemispheric runs. So I, I said I stripped away all the non-dynamical processes. It's not quite true. I have some dissipation in the model, and this is something I've kind of tinkered with and tuned. And so it has some hyper, scale selective hyperdiffusion. And it has a restoration throughout the troposphere towards, um, well, a restoration on temperature uh, with a time scale of 12 days, uh, independent of, of height. Um, that is, so that's just a Newtonian relaxation. And uh, on momentum and temperature, there's also a vertical diffusion, which is max in the low levels, uh, a bit less than a day, the time scale, and then also present in the free troposphere, but much weaker. Okay, so that's about it, really. And there's a bit of extra drag over land, but that's about it for the physics in this model. It's just a bit of damping, right? So um, the key is the forcing, right? Oh, oh yeah. Before we get onto that, yeah, it, no, I'm just going to skip that. that. That's technical. Okay. And so that's right. Um, yeah, it, it's a sort of community resource, this model. You have to join the club. It's a GitHub page. Okay. Um, and the data set. That's the all important thing here is the data set. So we use, recently, we've switched to uh, ERA interim. So we have 38 years of data uh, for the model variables, vorticity, divergence, temperature, and now specific humidity as well, I've included in the model. Um, there's no orography in the model, so the surface pressure is calculated using the hypsometric equation. And um, the mean orography, the effect of orography, is represented by the effect of the forcing, which I'm going to calculate. The timing is we have 38 years of data. So um, from 1979 to the end of 2016. Uh, so that is 55,520 records, four times daily data. Um, and so this is, this is a very useful table for just keeping track of how the model accounts for time. Um, and an annual cycle of 365 and a quarter days gives you 1,461 records, okay? Um, so, onto the, onto the core of how this works. So I'm going to slow down a bit now. Um, so, just for the purposes of illustration, imagine you have an equation for a tracer Q, so which is advected, and there's a forcing, and there's some linear function of Q, which is the dissipation. Um, if you separate that into a time mean component and a transient component, then you can write this development equation like this. The advection of the time mean of Q by the time mean flow will be balanced by the damping on the time mean, the time mean of the forcing, and this term, which is the time mean transient eddy 
uh, fluxes. Well, this is a kind of non-divergent uh, expression, but it doesn't make any difference. The time mean eddy fluxes can, this is dead, uh, the time mean eddy fluxes can be interpreted as a, uh, as a type of, as a component of the forcing, right? Um, so uh, that's a kind of intuitively easy to understand way of looking at it. I'm going to reinterpret that in a more generalized way now, just by thinking of phi as the uh, model state vector. So phi, well, no, it's the state vector of the observations, in fact. It's everything. It's u, v, q. And so this will develop according to some nonlinear advection operator, some linear dissipation operator, and a forcing. Okay. So that, likewise, can be separated into time, mean, and transients. So it is then the development of this phi dash is this operator applied to the climatology and the perturbation. And there's a mean forcing and a perturbation forcing, which forcing is in general a function of time, OK? Or you can write down the, um, the equation for the perturbation. Um, you can write it, well, it's the same equation. You can write it like this. There's a time mean component. Sorry. Oh, thank you. There's a, a time mean, the, the, the action of the model operator on the time mean. There's a linear uh, operator, which is the linearization of the model about that time mean. And there's a second order term. And uh, if you then take the average of that equation, the time mean budget is, again, it's, it's the equivalent of this. There's the action of that operator on the climatology. There's a second order term, which is the transient eddy fluxes. And there's the mean of the forcing. And then if you look at, if you subtract that from this, you get the eddy budget equation. And that is, you can develop a perturbation according to a linear uh, process around that climatology and a second order term. Now, the advantage, this is to illustrate the different types of um, separation you can do. Because this is my advocacy of using the time mean as a reference. Because the, the advantage of that is that this equation, all the terms in this equation average to zero. And they can be, uh, since they are variations around the observed time mean, they are actually realistic. They look like atmospheric variability. If you wanted to be a bit more uh, purist about this, you would say, well, that's no good to use the time mean, because it's not the solution of the primitive equations. If you use some, something which is a solution of the primitive equations, then you'll have a better post linear problem, but your perturbation will not be small. It'll be something large and something that doesn't look like anything like atmospheric variability. So the relevance of your linear problem is questionable. So th this is the trade-off. Okay? So yeah, that's just a little bit of philosophy. How does that relate to actually doing something practical like forcing this model? So let's go back to the um, development equation. And I'm going to slow down even more now. Right. So this is phi, the observed state vector. This is the model operator, an advection term, which is nonlinear, and a dissipation, which could probably be linear. right? And a forcing, which is unknown, and a function of time. Right? We don't know what that is. The, the, the task now is to find it. Okay? Now, if we introduce a model, and we call it psi, just to avoid confusion with the observations, right? then this, this is the model operator, so we know what it is. And what we're looking for is a forcing, g, which I will assume, and this is a big assumption, that g is independent of time. So I just want some practical model where I can just put something on the right-hand side of the equations and run it, and it will behave like a GCM. So I'm saying that g is equal to f bar, basically. That's my, it's as simple as that, right? g is equal to f bar. How do I find g? Right? Well, we can use the model and the data, right? So imagine that we run the model without any forcing, right? So just put zero on the right-hand side. Then the, just run it for one time step from some initial condition. Then the tendency that the model gives you will tell you what this is, this operator, given that initial condition, right? OK, so now let's just say I use the observations as an initial condition. And I have a whole string of observations of 55,000 uh, realizations of the observed atmosphere. I'm going to use all of them. 
and I'm going to do this 55,000 times, right? Just one time step, okay? And g is just the average of all those, right? If I say g is equal to the average of all these one time step forecasts, it will be the average of a plus d acting on phi, right? Which is what you, which is, which is f bar, okay? So that gives me g equals f bar. I can use the model on the observed data to find the forcing. So then I take that forcing that I've diagnosed and put it on the right-hand side, and I've got a GCM. So that's the trick, okay? Uh, it, the first time you encounter this, it takes a little bit of time to adjust to, so I'm just gonna stop for 30 seconds there, or 10 seconds, yeah. It, it can be, but it doesn't really matter. You just get a bunch of observations, and I indexes the observations, right? It doesn't necessarily have to, have to be in sequence. You just have to have a representative average set of atmospheric states. I will get to that, okay? Uh, the, the, it is equivalent, but uh, it needs to be explained why it's equivalent. <clears throat> but I've got a slide about that. Right, so is, one thing you might think is maybe this is cheating. Maybe we're just putting the answer in um, because we're just putting the observations in. That's not a model. That's just cheating, right? Well, no, it's not cheating because uh, formally what the model guarantees is that this is true, okay? So the average, the time average of A plus D on the model is equal to the time average of A plus D on the observations. That does not mean that my model climatology phi bar will look like the average of phi. Psi bar, sorry, will look like the average of phi. Because you break this down and it has two terms. It has the time mean term and the transient term. And they could balance differently in the model than in the observations, right? So the model might have systematic errors in its climatology and it will also have compensating systematic errors in its transients. And so it, it depends on whether the model is solving the right problem, whether or not it gives a good result, okay? So it is actually a proper model with its own internal variability and everything, and um, we'll see how good the result is, okay? So this is not the first time this has been done. I didn't invent this technique. Uh, as far as I know, the first person to do it was John Rhodes. Uh, then it was done by Marshall and Maltaini, and then Fabio D'Andrea had a crack at it, and then Hylin and Jack Durham were, were doing it when I arrived in McGill, and I'm, I think, the first person to do it with the primitive equations. And then there's a whole string of people who did it after that, right? Um, so that's not all. I mean, that, that's no, it's nice to have a simple GCM, but there's other things you can do. So let's go back to this equation again and uh, wading through some technical stuff here. But it, how about instead of defining a forcing G equals F bar, let's just define a forcing H, which is equal to A plus D acting on the climatology. So it's not the average of A plus D acting on the data, it is A plus D acting on the average of the data, okay? Now, what happens if I force the model with that and if I initialize with the climatology? Well, nothing, of course, because H is equal to this, right? And if my initial condition is that, then there'll be no development. H will directly cancel the model acting on its initial condition. So I'll have no development, right? I'll have a basic state which is my climatology, or it could be anything you want, right? And I've calculated exactly what's necessary to stop the model from developing. And this is what Gin and Hoskins did, and many other people, I think you, you cited a paper by Adrian Matthews, did the same thing. They, they just find that and then run the model, and, and it gives you a perturbation model because you've nailed the basic state in place. So it's not like a simple GCM. It doesn't have a turbulent eddy field. It has a, a, a basic state, and then you can introduce a, a perturbation in the initial condition, and it will give you a linear, if, if your perturbation is small, it will give you a linear model, that, that, that term will be small. So you've got a linear perturbation model where this is linearized about your climatology in this case, right? Um, so you can find solutions to that linear problem, and I've done this, you know, you can find the normal modes of the system, you can find the eigenmodes which have a, a frequent a structure, and a frequency, and a growth rate, sigma, and sigma, if sigma is positive, then it's unstable, you can find the unstable modes, right? Um, 
Alternatively, you don't put the perturbation in the initial condition. You can actually add a small perturbation forcing. And this approach gives you these kinds of solutions where you have uh, developing, uh, well, this is the Rossby wave that comes out of the tropical heating, for example. Right? You can just nail it. Bang in a tropical heating here and watch the wave develop. And it'll be linear, provided this is small. And you can even imagine finding the asymptotic solution, uh, which is independent of time. It, it will, provided all these modes are stable, so all these values of sigma must be negative, it will asymptote towards a time-independent solution. Trouble is, basic states tend to be unstable. So you have to find a way around that. I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's just talk a, a bit about the difference between G and H. Um, recall our tracer advection formulation, OK? So um, the time mean of this equation is the time mean advection of Q is balanced by the dissipation applied to the time mean of Q, a mean forcing, and a transient only forcing. Okay? So, so um, this is my time mean advection dissipation. This is my mean forcing, which is G. Okay, and this is my transient eddy forcing, and the sum of the two is H. So H is equal to the what you might call the diabatic forcing plus the transient eddy forcing. Okay, and that's just another way of interpreting it. Um, okay, a word, John's question, a word on damping and restoration. So uh, there are some. There is like the held Suarez uh, approach, where you have a standard radio to convective equilibrium state, and you relax towards it. And that's a way of forcing the GCM. In what way is my approach equivalent to that? And you can just look at the equation, right? So I have a tendency, a nonlinear term, a forcing, and a damping, right? This is held Suarez. This is a tendency, a nonlinear term, a restoration time scale, if you like, or one over time scale, a radiative convective equilibrium state, and the model state, where you, you, you restore the difference between the two, which can be written like this. It's R times phi star, which is G, and R times phi, which is this. So it's the same, OK? Provided D is diagonal, it's the same. Um, but my forcing is the restoration state divided by the time scale of the damping. And my damping is just that one over the time scale of their damping. The difference is that the restoration approach, you specify some idealized radiative convective state which you've dreamed of. Okay? Uh, I'm more objective. I don't care what that state looks like. I could calculate it, but I don't care what it is because I've found out the forcing. Right? And the damping, I specify myself. Yeah. So we're converging towards the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what does it look like? This is the forcing on temperature, specific humidity, and zonal wind at low levels, 80.85 and upper levels, 0.25. And a lot of the forcing, uh, this, so this is G, OK? A lot of it looks for, for, for winter season. A lot of it, the, the strongest part of it is just putting in what the lack of orography is leaving out in the model. In Greenland and Antarctica always show up when orography is important, the Andes as well. Um, the humidity is interesting. I mean, what it's doing is the atmosphere um, brings in humidity towards the, the the equatorial region and then throws it up into the upper atmosphere and it's removed by precipitation and it's resupplied by evaporation. So that's what my forcing needs to do. Um, vertical profiles of this forcing, well, here we have G, here we have H. And the difference between G and H, as I said, is the transient eddy forcing for temperature. So a lot of what it's doing is just redressing what the diffusion has done at low levels. So if you, if you show it without diffusion, it becomes very, there's not much forcing at all, really, in the temperature. Um, for, um, what is this? 
specific humidity, uh, it just shows you what I showed you before. You're evaporating it in the subtropics and raining it out at upper levels at the equator. The transients are doing something there as well. And then for momentum, um, there's some orographic drag which you have to represent, and the transients are doing what they do. Right? The, the transients are accelerating the jets at uh, a couple of levels. Um, so how about, let's get to the, uh, to the validation then. So how, do, how well does it work? This is um, DJF, and this is a perpetual DJF model experiment. Um, so this is low level zonal wind, okay? Um, meridional wind and temperature. And this, so this is a long-term mean. Right? So I've got my jets in the right places, a bit weak in the southern hemisphere. I've got systematic errors. Yeah? Uh, temperature's very good indeed. Obviously, that is largely a dissipative problem. And the meridian of wind, the stationary wave structure looks good. Um, upper level winds, again, it looks very good. Um, so uh, don't have much to criticize there. Uh, Humidity. Well, we do have a humidity variable in the model, and we are forcing it, and it, it gives you a pretty decent humidity distribution. Um, we're just, um, we have sources and sinks of humidity which represent evaporation and precipitation. Transients. So these are the unfiltered transients uh, for winter. And you can see that it kind of getting the storm tracks in the right places. It is a bit weak in the southern hemisphere. This is, what is this? Um, Temperature flux. Yeah, yeah sorry, I, I, I should have said this. This is low level, 850 millibar V dash T dash. So it's meridional heat flux, temperature flux. And uh, this is the V dash Q dash. So this is moisture flux. Right? Um, so we've got the storm tracks in the right places. This is unfiltered, remember. Uh, it's, it seems to be a bit weak in the southern hemisphere uh, in, the, in the northern winter. And it is very weak on eddy kinetic energy, especially in the southern hemisphere. Um, this is the, so sorry, this is the momentum flux. So you can see that convergent momentum flux at the storm track exit there. Um, it's getting that. Uh, this is eddy kinetic energy. It's getting it well located, okay, but weak. And uh, so for the filtered transients, so this is less than 10 day filtered, um, some very nice storm tracks. For the temperature flux, still a bit weak in the southern hemisphere. For the humidity flux, very nice. Uh, and momentum flux and eddy kinetic energy, right? So I think we have a GCM which we can use uh, for all sorts of things, right? And do they tell you something? Do they, do they tell you something about the nature of the well, I think uh, I always wonder why it's not quite performing in the southern hemisphere, right? And, and I think it's the model is free to choose whatever dynamical balance it wants. And so the the, the feral cell uh, at upper levels has a balance between transient eddies and the Coriolis force, and at lower levels it has a, a balance between the Coriolis force and, and drag. Okay. So maybe there's something wrong with the drag, which is giving you a weak feral cell, which is consistent with weak transients. Uh, uh, that's, but I don't know what to do about that. Um, so yeah, you can kind of look at balances and, and say, well, what's different in the model to reality? The model is free to find its own equilibrium between the transient part and the mean advection part. Um, so yeah. Uh, I'm going to move on now to adding an annual cycle to this model, right? So are there any more questions before I do that? Yeah, I just used DJF, a quarter of that 55,000. Yeah. Do you have a sense with this kind of model whether adding vertical horizontal river uh, it helps you to use computer time. But I, I have recently update, upgraded the resolution. It was T31L10 for a long time. Now it's T42L15. And I don't see much evidence that it's improved the model, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> All right, so this is a kind of mini talk within a talk here, uh, which I've very recently produced, so I'm still getting to grips with this. Everything you never wanted to know about the annual cycle, but you were too polite to leave. Um, this is what I did in Brazil this, this year. Uh, and um, so, well, I'm going to skip through this fairly quickly, but uh, you can, the idealized, the kind of understanding we have of the annual cycle is that it's come, something which comes from, it's something very regular, and it just comes from orbital considerations and the sea surface temperature. So you can represent it as a time, a, a time development, uh, some damping and some forcing, which is cyclic, okay? And the solution to this equation is uh, an exponential decay and two terms, one of which is in phase and the other one which is in quadrature. And the importance of these two terms depends on how much damping you have. If you have a, a weak dissipation, it's out of phase. So that's like uh, the ocean response. And if you have strong dissipation, it's in phase. That's more like a, a balanced atmospheric response. You can subsume this into the forcing if you want and just talk about the atmosphere. And, um, and it gets back to some sort of restoration thing. But that's, this is all kind of linear and assuming that the model responds linearly to a regular forcing. And the model is nonlinear. So if you add a perturbation and uh, add a nonlinear term, then you get all sorts of extra terms in the forcing. And then the question is how important are those extra terms? There are interactions between. So if the twiddle is the annual cycle and the dash is everything else, there are interactions between the annual cycle and the mean, between the annual cycle and, the, and itself, between the annual cycle and the transients to, to look at. So suddenly you've got a lot of terms to consider in the forcing. So we're going to explore that a little bit. Here's just a GCM experiment by Biasuti and Battisti, um, where they looked at the importance of the SST for forcing annual cycle and the radiative forcing, and they find that both are important. Okay. Um, so what do I do? I've got to go back to my forcing strategy. And, and now I have to uh, think of F as having an annual cycle in it. Right? So this is my model. Well, this, these are the observations, but this is the model. Right? And now I want G not just to be F bar, but F bar plus F tilde. So tilde is an average annual cycle. Right? So we, we cut up the flow now into three components, the mean, the mean annual cycle, and the rest, everything else. Okay? And, but G, I don't want transients in G. I just want G to be an annual, a, a cyclic, steady cyclic forcing. All right? mm -hmm. So anything which is not either steady or cyclic is because the model, of the model's own dynamics. It's not coming from the forcing. All right? So you can actually write down an equation for, for this F bar plus F tilde in terms of the model operator, okay? assuming D is linear still. And so this is like, you, you get a lot of interaction terms between uh, nonlinear terms involving these three different components. So you have the mean, mean advection. You have the advection terms between the mean and the annual cycle, between the annual cycle and itself. And then you have the interactions with the transients. Okay? And these all have uh, aspects. These all, well, some of them contribute to the time mean. Some of them contribute to the annual cycle. Right? So I've broken it down into, oh, and yes, there's also now a tendency term, which has nothing to do with the model. You have to calculate that straight from the data. Okay? Uh, so I just did a sense of difference to find that. So I have my mean mean term, my mean cycle term, my cycle cycle term, my cycle transient term, and my transient transient term. And we can calculate each one of those components of the forcing and look at them individually. So isn't that fun? We can have so much fun doing this. So the question is, how do we find them? And how do we separate them out? So this is a bit, bit fiendish. Uh, you, well, first of all, the tendency term. Uh, oh, I've, run, I've killed the, or your battery again. I'm sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> the tendency term is calculated straight from the data set. The um, mean mean term is just like before. It's like H. It's like finding H. So you just have you initialize from the climatology, one time step, and you've got it, right? The mean cycle and cycle cycle terms, well, that is like initializing from 
one average annual cycle. So 1,461 single tie step runs is all you need. And you've got MM plus MC plus CC, all right, which is from this. You already know MM, so you've got MC plus CC. How do you separate the two? Well, you do it again, but you put an arbitrary factor in front of the annual cycle, and then you use a bit of algebra from those two runs to separate them, and you've got MC and CC. So then you're ready to try and find the transient terms. So you, you start with the whole data set, 55,000 runs, okay, from phi bar, phi tilde, and phi dash, that gives you MM plus MC plus CC plus CT plus TT, okay? You know this, these three, so it gives you CT plus TT. How do you separate those two? Well, you put an arbitrary factor in front of the phi dash, a bit of algebra, and you've got those two, so you've collected them all, okay? Um, so, what are these terms? What do they contribute to? Well, the tendency just contributes to the annual cycle, not to the mean. It's linear, okay? MM only contributes to the mean and not to the cycle, but it has linear and nonlinear components. MC does not contribute to the mean, only to the cycle. It's linear and nonlinear. These other terms are just nonlinear, and they contribute to both CC, CT, and TT. So let's have a look at them. And again, the um, fact that I have this. Um, vertical diffusion in the boundary layer kind of interferes a lot with the solution. So I'm just going to remove the vertical diffusion in the boundary layer to clarify things. And um, this is using the model to do diagnostics on, on the era interim data set, basically, um, in, a, in a kind of novel way. So this model is not just for doing simulations. It's a diagnostic tool. Okay, so this is my implied <coughs> forcing, MM. Um, this is my transient advection term. And this is my total forcing, right? So you can see it shows up like before for the humidity um, and for the, for the winds. Okay? Um, and we can break it down season by season. And then we start to see the contribution of the tendency term, right? And it's extremely small. Right? So but which terms are important? Well, the MM is obviously important, but it has no seasonal cycle, right? MC is clearly very important. This is temperature and humidity forcing we're looking at here. CC is not negligible. That's the cycle interacting with itself. So you see it's like the combination of the time mean flow advecting the annual cycle of the tracer plus the annual cycle of the flow advecting the time mean of the tracer. Okay? Then we have TT, which is, as before, it's the transient eddy fluxes, um, excluding the annual cycle. And that's important, just as you'd expect it to be. Right? Well, CT is rather unimportant. There's a big separation in time scales between typical dynamical transients in the atmosphere and the annual cycle. So they don't interact very much. Um, so we'll just skip through the seasons. Uh, you, you get the same story every time. And I just want to concentrate in on one thing, which I found to be the most interesting aspect of this is the maintenance of tropical humidity. And so if you look at MM, this is the annual mean of these forcing components. MM basically has to provide rainfall in the tropics and evaporation in the subtropics. Okay, You see the ITCZ in there. CC, the cycle-cycle term that I just evoked, seems to have a, a clear annual mean signal uh, over over West Africa, so we're rectifying something over West West Africa with the with the cycle cycle interaction. CT is negligible, and TT is basically extra tropical. Um, so how what's going on? So let's break it down into um, the four seasons: DJF, MAM, JJA, SON, and the three plots for each season: MC, CC, and TT. Let's just look at MC to start with. Um, you see that the Hadley cell is ascending to the south and descending in the north. That's the kind of DJF Hadley cell. It stays like that through MAM, and then it flips in the northern summer, and it's, it's rising in the north and descending in the south. And then it stays like that into the autumn. Now, if you look at the CC term, um, you have something which is kind of rising in the north and descending in the south over the over West Africa, over the land mass, okay? And it stays the same in March, April, May, 
and it stays the same in the opposite season. It doesn't change sign. And so the, like, the African monsoon is, uh, exists in the summer because it's a reinforcement between the MC term and the CC term, and it's not there in the winter because it's a, there's a cancellation between these two terms. Right? So my, I'm still getting to grips with this, but my understanding of my results, I'm just going to read this to you. So the CC term over West Africa remains the same sign in opposite seasons, leading to a partial cancellation of MC in DJF and reinforcement in JJA. We can explain this in terms of seasonal anomaly covariance. The flow reverses, but crucially, so do the seasonal anomaly humidity gradients. Right? So the covariance between the divergence anomaly and the humidity anomaly retains the same sign, leading to drying in the Guinean zone and moistening of the Sahel in both summer and winter, and all year round. So in the winter, this partially cancels the linear component, and in the summer, it reinforces it. And so cyclic changes in wind direction shift the humidity distribution. This is the onset of the African monsoon. And that then interacts with the seasonal anomaly flow. And it's this covariant interaction that characterizes the, the African monsoon. Right. As I say, I'm still getting to grips with that. But, uh, let's just step back now and look at a validation of this model with an annual cycle. And uh, <clears throat> so we have our two specifications for the forcing. We have the cyclic in red and the old perpetual version in purple. And on the right, we have perpetual runs for summer and winter. And in the middle, we have the full annual cycle run, which I ran for about 12 years and then just looked at the seasons. And on the left, we have the data. And so you can see that the model is basically doing, if you just look at the first and third rows, you can see that the model is doing something very similar with a full annual cycle as it was with the perpetual simulations. And that is consistent with the, um, the fact that we have very small contribution from that tendency term in, in the annual cycle forcing. Right? Um, so that's the end of the section on um, the GCM. Moisture budget over West Africa is an interesting case of looking at the annual cycle budget. The budget separation highlights is a two-phase onset, reversed winds followed by an interaction with a modified humidity gradient. Um, the perpetual runs are consistent with a small tendency term. And this technique, this technique that I invented to separate out all those terms, can be applied to other types of time scale separation as well. So that's something in perspective. Mm. Right, any questions at this point? How am I doing anyway? You know? I've got still got loads to talk about. But, uh, <laughs> how long have I got? Tell me. Tell me honestly, how long have I got? Oh, God. There's a huge advantage to having an annual cycle in the model, and that is that it is, corresponds one-to-one -one with the data set. Right? So if I want to nudge part of my solution, I can just nudge it, and it, it just tracks in, in tandem with the, with, the, with the era interim data set. There's nothing to worry about. It's, it's very much like what I was showing yesterday, you see, with those, with those boundary conditions. So for me, that's one big advantage. The other, again, I, I mean, it's a diagnostic tool as well as a, a model. So. All right, I'm, I've got, I'm going to run over time a little bit, but uh, I want to show you this, uh, uh, some perturbation runs, because this is the kind of thing you might be able to do uh, this week. So here is, we're, we're going to get interested now in South American rainfall, okay? And uh, so this is the stationary wave number, which is a kind of, it's a graphic which, which gives you an idea. It's like a refractive index for Rossby waves, okay? They're attracted towards low values of this, and they're not allowed to go into these white areas where, the, where we have easterlies and, and the, the wave number is not real, okay? So there's no propagation in those areas, but the, crucially, you see there is propagation in this area, and we're interested in the rainfall here over Sao Paulo, and so what could influence it? That's the question we're asking. 
uh, what kind of teleconnections could influence rainfall in that region. And they could be Rossby waves coming from, from the southern hemisphere, or they could even come through here. So we are going to do some modeling studies to address that uh, question. So this is now using the model with that perturbation configuration. So we're forcing it with H, and we're putting in a convective heat source. All right? So this is a convective, just by way of example, this is a convective heat source over uh, the mid-Pacific. And the plot we're looking at is vertical velocity. So blue is up, red is down. And um, we're going to run the model for 15 days with that convective heating in place. Okay. Um, so just looking at the vertical velocity. So you see that Kelvin wave, downwelling Kelvin wave going around the Earth. And at the same time, on a slightly longer time scale, you see this um, extratropical response developing. It's unusual to look at it in terms of vertical velocity, but it's still there. Right? Why are we looking at vertical velocity? Because that's one thing which might be important for rainfall. Okay. And in this case, you can see that, uh, obviously, over the heating, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go up, right? Uh, it turns out that over the South Polar region, it's going down. So you might expect that to lead to dry conditions in our target region of interest there. Okay. So another thing which might influence rainfall is the supply of the moisture. Okay. So this model has a moisture variable. So we can look at... Um, the vertically integrated humidity flux convergence, or divergence. So, so what we have is blue is convergent and orange is divergent. And um, we can just show the same run in terms of that diagnostic. And you can see, obviously, it's converging at low levels where you're heating. But it's more complicated because it's in, you still see the Kelvin wave. It's interacting with the climatological humidity field. Um, so it's the dynamical response interacting with the humidity field. And it seems that it's quite consistent that you'll get divergence of humidity in the target zone. So this is really a drying signal for South America for that particular source region. Okay, You can look at the two of them together. Um, so contours are humidity flux convergence and shading is omega. And so where you see these two diagnostics agreeing, that's the strongest clue for some information about rainfall. Um, even though it's just a dynamical model, there's no rainfall scheme in this model. <coughs> Essentially, they're probably playing the same thing. Not, not, motion, there's moisture flux, there's not really, no. I mean, th this time, yeah, but no, look, look at this, right? Um, this is a scatter plot of one against the other, right? So this is omega, so downward this is dry, and upward this is wet, and this is the humidity flux divergence, so positive is dry, negative is wet. So yeah, it lines up. In that sense, it's telling you the same thing, but look at how it develops in time, right? It starts off very nice um, over the heating zone, right? And then as the teleconnections spread out, they become more and more conflictual over the, over the globe, these two different measures. And it fills out that, those four quadrants, depending on, and, and uh, Jose Landra has labeled them with different latitudes. So, so the bolder points are the tropical points and the fainter points are the river. So that, 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 uh, it's not a, they're not always in agreement. Um, so we're trying to pick places where they are. So that's just one forward experiment. So uh, we thought, well, we want to know about everywhere which might influence South America. Okay? So we're going to do all these experiments, every last one of them. 15-day um, runs for each point. We're going to heat over each point. And our, remember, our, well, so the blue points are done with a deep convective profile and the red points with a shallow profile, okay? And um, so we're gonna, I can't show you hundreds of, of videos because I have like minus 10 minutes left. So, but um, I can show you what we call an influence function. So what we will do is we will look at this area here, okay? And we'll bang in a heating somewhere and we'll look at the response at this point. And, but we'll plot it over here, where we put the heating, right? And, and so that gives you a, a map like this, okay? So if you, for example, if you heat here, then you'll, after 15 days, you'll produce a vertical velocity downward response here. If you heat here, 
after 15 days, you'll produce a vertical velocity upward response here. So that's the con oh, sorry, no, that's the humidity flux divergence, yeah. So in terms of moisture supply, you'll have a drying response if you heat here, a moistening response if you heat here. In terms of vertical velocity, you'll have a moistening response if you heat here. So here you have an agreement, okay? Both measures will give you a moistening response in the target time after 15 days. Now, you can run this out. You can, you can plot functions like that for one-day runs, two-day runs, three-day runs. Okay, so you can actually put a movie of this function on and watch it spread out from the source zone as the lead time increases. And you see a backwards propagating Rossby wave. And if you use your imagination, you can think of it going through the waveguide there as well. Um, but the influence is fairly weak far afield compared to the influence of actually just heating over the target zone, of course. Even though, even if you heat over the target zone, you produce a conflicting response in this case because the onshore advection becomes important, you see. Um, so uh, just remember this point here. There's a pretend, so this is the best way to get rainfall in Sao Paulo is to heat over Bolivia, right? Because that gives you a big blue blob uh, and a big blue contour, right? But uh, there's a possible teleconnection here. I mean, you could, even if you heat here, then you'll get the right moisture flux convergence response here. Um, but uh, let's look at. Sorry, the reason where you have put initially the heating doesn't pop up here at all. Yeah. Uh, the, well, what I'm plotting here. Well, if it, if, yeah, well, if it's not very strong, it doesn't, it's not plotted. I don't plot the zero contour, right? But, but yeah, uh, that, that on equator example I showed apparently is a weak response compared to what Jose Leandro decided to plot here. Um, oh, no, here's the uh, scatter plot. So this is now an influence function scatter plot as it develops in time. Uh, it's usually consistent, right? The big cross is if you heat in situ, right? So that's not consistent, as I as I showed. But most most source regions will give you a consistent picture between those two um, measures. And uh, just a couple more examples, and I think I'll have to stop. Right? So how about this hot spot here that I'd identified? Let's, let's just run a forward run from there. So this is now a forward run. Uh, God, I press it again. Uh, and it throws off a gravity wave to start with, and then you get this um, effective development. Um, and you can see that there's a consistent response over the, uh, over the target region there, if you heat on the black dot. Right? And I okay, guess it's a 15-day run. And finally, there's an example with ray tracing. So this is Jose Leandro kind of likes doing this. You can calculate from that stationary wave, Rossby wave equation, you can calculate the phase speed and direction of the, of the, of the ray. And he's plotted that along with the vertical velocity and the stream function. You see those rays going out from this example point here, uh, which is rather, rather pretty, I think. So, yeah. Can I just clarify something? Yeah, yeah, you have to pick your level, yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know what level he must have used some upper level, I guess. Right, I think I'd better stop there. Uh, uh, I've got to, I mean, there's other stuff in the overheads. Uh, can I say one more thing? Because I've got something about adding moisture to carbon waves, which is relevant to what we were talking about yesterday with Speedy, right? Let me just show you one, one picture. Okay. So I've added a, a moisture, uh, I've added a large scale condensation scheme to the model. Uh, so you do one of these perturbation runs where you have a carbon wave, and you can plot it uh, with various different basic states. And this is a dry model, and then this is with a large scale condensation scheme. And so the dry model always gives you this fast, regular Kelvin wave. You put in the condensation, and it goes to hell, and it produces these kind of patterns. So that's vertical velocity. If you look at the um, velocity potential, it goes. So what I've done is increased the 
const the uh, L, the specific latent heat, just varied it between zero and its correct value. And if it's very close to zero, you get this dry Kelvin wave, and then it just morphs into this slower response if, if you have that large scale condensation fully in the model. So. And that's just large scale condensation. There's no convection scheme there. Right, I really am going to stop.